Bonsoir, bon après-midi à tous. Uh, bienvenidos a todos. Voy a pasar al inglés. Je vais parler en anglais. I think it's the probably common language. If you'll just give me a moment to close out of this and open this one. In one moment. <laughs> Three, two, one. And a half. <laughs> and one. Um, maybe. Here we go. Uh, on pourrait changer au micro pour que je tienne le micro à main. C'est possible. Ça gêne personne. Merci. C'est bon. C'est bon. Merci. Um, I have a hard time actually standing behind a podium because I don't I don't want to be far away from everyone. Um, my uh, story, my journey, and what you're going to hear tonight is about reconnecting humans to the natural world. But it's also about reconnecting humans to each other and to yourselves. So there'll be a couple of things that I'll ask you to do tonight that might make you feel a little uncomfortable. I, I want you to just embrace the discomfort. Um, I have had such amazing connections um, since I just got here yesterday. And um, I feel that if those connections are an indication at all of what we're capable of, you will all embrace what we'll do. So the first thing um, I would like everyone to do, because it's called pied à terre, and um, yes, symbolically it means to have a place somewhere, but a pied à terre literally means a foot on the ground. So can everybody put both your feet on the ground? And I'm sorry to ask you this, can you put your phones down? And I would like even the cameramen, si vous pouvez juste pendant une minute, hein? to take two really deep breaths. Because that first breath comes from the forest. It comes from plants. It comes from the trees. If you take a second breath, that second breath comes from the oceans. Microscopic phytoplankton creating the oxygen we breathe. So every breath is from this planet. If you take five breaths, the fifth breath literally comes from the Amazon. And that's a place I hold close to my heart. 20% of our oxygen comes from the Amazon. So when we think we're not connected to this planet, all we have to do is breathe to remember. And it's a very simple thing I ask people to do. You can go back to your iPhones, vos caméras. <laughs> it's a small exercise. So what I'd like to do is um, just take you on a journey with me. Um, and I... Um, I deviate quite a lot. I have a goal in the end. Um, but I'd like to take you on a journey that isn't straight. I show you this picture here. Um, my husband took this of me underwater. I didn't know that I was pregnant. <laughs> so for me, it's also very symbolic of, of life, life itself. If you ever go diving or even snorkeling and you put your mask right where you have the top of your mask above the water, and the bottom of your mask below. That's called split level. And if we can use that in all of life, split level allows you to see everything that is above and below. It's the whole picture. It gives you an idea that everything is interconnected. Whatever happens above the water will impact what's below. Whatever is happening below water will impact what's above. And if we can take that kind of perspective into life, we start to see the whole picture. We start to be more open to something we might not be looking for. And I think that that's something really crucial for us to remember going through life. Now, these images, I didn't take any of them. Sorry, I didn't put any copyright. I have a, an esteemed photographer here, so I feel I have to put that disclaimer there. <laughs> I stole them from the internet. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I feel like I just said my Hail Mary. Um, so in this, these photographs for me are what we want to see, right? You want to go on vacation. You want to see the world as something beautiful. You want to go to a beach that's white and clean. You want to go to an ocean that's shimmery and blue. You want to see beautiful colors above and below, right? This is a lens that we put on. These are our glasses. And this is what we choose to see. And sometimes that is exactly what we see, but at the expense of the other side of the picture. Now, I love going on vacation. And now that I've been officially invited by pied -à terre I will be making a real effort to actually call it a vacation and not take my work with me. But the world that I see is this one. I don't often go to the beautiful places. I go to the hard places. 
And those hard places for me are a perspective. They're eye-opening, and I am thankful for them. This is actually the slum area of Iquitos in, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, if you do go to Iquitos, you'll probably land in Iquitos. You might go to a hotel. You might get on a boat and then go into the jungle, and your tour guides will show you what you want to see. But you probably won't go to the slums of Belen. But what's important here is these people live side by side with this environment, but they also live side by side with the people that live up at the top of the hill where there's water, there's clean water. Now, what do you think happens in an area like this if you don't have running water? What do you do with your trash? You dump it. What do you do with your human waste? You dump it into the river. This is the Amazon River. Where does the Amazon River go? Into the ocean. So it's not just about them. This is just one small example. We all do this. We do this the world over. And this, for me, is also about connecting ecosystems. If you think, oh, the Amazon rainforest is so far away, what does the river have to do with me? It goes into our oceans, our communal oceans, right? So being able to help and educate is our role. Being able to give proper services to these communities is our job. And that's how I see all of this. There is never a question of blaming and never moving forward with guilt, because guilt doesn't last very long. I don't want anyone here to feel guilty about what you have. Celebrate it, love it, cherish it, but have the perspective of what that value is, and then be able to go out into the world and understand how much you can actually give of your time, of your services, of your connections. All of that really matters. And that's the platform that I've chosen. I may have skipped. So um, what you're seeing here, um, there is a disclaimer. It's from the Environmental uh, Justice Foundation. <clears throat> um, but this really shocked me when I heard about this. If you, you look clearly at the images, you may think that this is an uncommon sight, these horrible ships, um, horrible working conditions. These are ghost ships, is what they're called. These are ships that are out in the open seas. Now, the open seas are areas that are uh, 200 miles offshore. There is no governance, there's no ownership, which means there's no responsibility. And what people do is they take these ships out, they put them out in the open seas, they basically have slave labor on board. The people that go there to work think that they're getting a good life, but they have to buy their way off the boat. There's no governance, so there's no police, there's no human rights organizations, there's no health organizations, right? So these boats are out there for three, four months at a time, and what happens is you have other bigger boats that go out to meet these boats out in the open ocean. And they offload all of the fish onto a different boat with a different flag. And that boat now carries the fish from the open seas to the shore. And all the information is lost. We have no idea who caught our fish, how it was caught, what fish was caught, what were the conditions. And so the moment that boat lands, it will have a flag, we'll say Costa Rica, it's a beautiful country, but let's say Costa Rica came in with the flag on the boat and then offloads the fish onto shore. It is officially caught by a legal, with a permit, with a different flagship. So we here have lost all that information. It's called traceability. It's something that I worked on for four years uh, with the Council on Oceans for the World Economic Forum we had the task between 12 of us of determining what were the most important issues with oceans. All of the oceans, everywhere. And this was one that really stood out because it stood out because of human rights, because of health issues, because of security issues, and because of the fact that these are global waters and that there is a global responsibility. So the traceability of our fish, that very crucial piece of understanding of knowing where your food comes from. It's very simple. Now, I'm not completely vegetarian, but I am pretty strict about what I eat. I will only occasionally eat sustainable seafood. And I have the seafood watch guide on my phone. And if somebody serves me, typically I just accept what I'm served, because I figure if the animal died, I don't want it to go in the trash for nothing. But what if I'm trying to do things right, and I have no idea about what happened in the whole process? So this is one example of what happens. A fish uh, taken in the Bering Sea, by one boat, gets passed on to another, ends up landing in Russia, and, and, um, and then goes off to China to get packaged. 
Well, now the origin has changed as well. It's no longer the Bering Sea because the moment you fillet a fish, that's where your, your fish originates from. So even when wholesalers are trying to do the, the right thing, it's very hard to understand. And when the buyers are trying to do the right thing, you see how many steps away we are. So it's important for us to understand our food systems in our connection with our environment. And don't worry, this won't be all negative. There's always goodness. And somebody said this to me earlier. They said, wow, we were so surprised at how, by, how positive you and Amy were and how happy you were considering the kind of work you do. We're like, well, we kind of have to be, right? We see these things day in and day out, but we see the amazing goodness in the world. And I think it's important to remember that no matter what we're talking about tonight. This photograph, it doesn't matter where it's taken. It can be anywhere. We have trash everywhere, right? In some countries, we pay people to clean up after us. But I've seen it in every single city, people throwing cigarette butts, trash, whatever it is, right? That ends up somewhere. It ends up in our waterways. It ends up in our seas. 70% of deep water fish have some form of plastic. Where does that fish go, right? It goes up the food chain. And it's not just fish. Phytoplankton are found with little plastic, microplastic particles in them. Well, it goes up the food chain. Now, on the bottom one, we're not polar bears, so maybe exist that, just ignore that one. But who's at the top of that food chain at the top? It's us. So the plastic that goes into the oceans comes back into us. And so when people, when I see that people don't think, don't know, or worse, don't care, I want to bring that full circle back to this notion that it all comes back to us in the end. So it is our interest. I am happy to put the human being at the center of the environmental story, because we are. We're at the beginning of it and we're at the end of it where we receive everything back. And so that notion of full circle should inspire us. It should inspire us for good. These guys don't want plastic in their fish and they certainly don't want the antibiotics that go into the salmon farming either, but they don't have a choice. We do. And that choice is such a luxury. To be able to have knowledge is something so powerful because it gives us a responsibility, but it also gives us a choice. I had a friend once tell me, he said, you know, Celine, it must be so difficult being you. <laughs> no, um, but why? <laughs> he said, because you have to think about everything you do all day. And it really shocked me that that would be difficult, that I actually think through my entire day. <laughs> but it's a series of choices, right? You have this knowledge. So, I mean, I'm thrilled, I'm sitting here. I actually turned down water because I thought somebody was gonna bring me a plastic bottle. And then I saw glasses and I just went, oh God, thank you. Those are the choices, right? There was a choice made, Nobody w nobody's in pain, nobody's suffering from that choice. And so I do, I encourage people to think all day. It doesn't have to hurt. <laughs> but just once you have knowledge, start implementing those things in your day and you'll realize, well, I'm not actually worse off and I'm happy and I'm doing well. I travel with a fork, knife, and spoon, bamboo, and a little metal straw. And you know, people tell me, oh God, but I can't remember it. I'm like, do you pack your wallet? Do you pack your keys, your chapstick, whatever it is that you put in your purse? Well, just make that a habit. You start throwing it in. Maybe a little bit more difficult for men who don't have purses, but maybe we'll change the fashion world. <laughs> One step at a time, I can't do it all. So here's a beautiful story, and it happens to be in Mexico. Um, I had the privilege of going to a place called Cabo Pulmo. Has anybody been there? You have. I heard her, fr the first thing you did was you went, <gasps> right? There's that breath. Thank you, Ocean. <laughs> Anyone else been to Cabo Pulmo? A few. Stunning. Cabo Pulmo, Mexique? No, c'est au Mexique. Uh, ouais, c'est pas loin de Los Cabos. Ouais. C'est un, un site absolument incroyable. I mean, for divers, it's... It's Mecca. I'm sorry. Literally, I have never seen a concentration of fish like this. But here's, here's the wonderful part of the story. This place was completely overfished. The, the town of Cabo Pulmo was a fishing village, is a fishing village. But they were taking so much out of the ocean that they were realizing, wow, there's almost nothing left. And two fishermen families said, you know what, we need to convince the town to stop fishing. Convince the town to stop doing what they do for a living was their initiative. And although there was a lot of resistance, they were able to do it. They got the help of the government. And for 10 years, from the time I, when I went, it was 10 years old, they had protected and created a marine area that had absolutely no extraction. And the flora and fauna came back to its baseline. 
The baseline is essentially what it is before we had any impact on it. And the baseline of this place looks like an aquarium. I have, there is nowhere in the world I've been diving that has this concentration of fish. Now, there are plenty of areas in the world to go diving. But this, for me, was incredible. And to hear that story was inspiring. And I thought, you know, there goes this thing, a small group of people doing something absolutely amazing. And they realized over the course of time, first of all, the fish have no idea where the boundaries of the marine reserve are. They go in and out. So their fish catch actually increased. They were catching fish outside the marine reserve. And as soon as things got a little bit stable, they were allowed to fish inside the marine reserve, what they could feed their family that day. Economy coming from the outside, food coming from the inside of the reserve, and dive tourism bringing in economy. So everybody wins. And that, for me, is a really good, albeit small, example of what we're capable of when we understand the full process. Everyone's thriving. Now, they are pretty hardcore. They want to keep their village the way it is. They don't want electricity. So they already have the force of understanding their two feet in the ground and knowing what's precious to them and wanting to protect it. My god, there's a princess in the castle. <laughs> there's something there's something not just because of the sparkles, but just the whole idea of like a princess in a castle. I think I'm five again. <laughs> Sorry for the pause, but I have to. Um, the Amazon away from the oceans, back up river into the Amazon. I started going to the Amazon when I was nine years old um, with my grandfather. And a very unusual thing to do, um, but at the time it seemed normal to me. <laughs> I flew in, my grandmother was already aboard Calypso. Um, she was actually on the boat more than anybody in my family, more than my grandfather, my father, my uncle combined. She would leave the port on Calypso. She wouldn't come home until Calypso came home. So for me, she is really the, the true center. And even my grandfather said she's the true captain of that boat. So she was already there with the entire crew. I flew in with my grandfather. My mom was on some hiking expedition somewhere in the jungle. She was a photographer for 13 years. My dad was on a raft with my brother somewhere else. Just another day in the Cousteau family, I guess. <laughs> but it was the first time I was really exposed to that kind of extreme environment and that kind of just absolutely unique ecosystem. But as a kid, I didn't think intellectually. I went, oh, butterflies, <gasps> frogs, yeah, piranha. Because the scientist did bring me out onto the canoe to go catch piranha so he could study them. And he brought me barefoot. And he thought it was very funny to put the piranha at the bottom of the canoe next to my feet. So you rem I remember all of these things, just the emotions, right? The laughing, just the, the, the breathing, the animals, the rainforest, walking, and just feeling so overwhelmed with all of these senses. We need to get back to that. Just let yourself be overwhelmed with senses, right? So now here's the second thing I'm going to ask you to do. This one is internal. You can breathe if you'd like. Think about the one thing in your life, and you, you can make a list and then mm, take some away the one thing in your life that is the most important thing to you. And just hold on to that. What is the most important thing in your life? Yeah. Okay, so just hold on to that. Now I'm going to take you a little deeper into the jungle. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the tribes of uh, the Brazilian Amazon asked me to tell their story. This is a place called the Vale do Javari. It's uh, 85,000 square kilometers. It's the size of Portugal, actually. Um, and I went there in 2007, going back to places my grandfather had been to in the early 80s, so back when I was nine years old. And I had an opportunity to go into this indigenous territory. We were invited uh, to a conference of the contacted tribes. So 85,000 square kilometers, the size of Portugal. There's 5,000 contacted people in six different ethnicities. 5,000 in six different ethnicities, okay? They all have their unique language and, and, uh, and their culture. There's also the largest number of people living in complete isolation in the entire Amazon. These are people that have not had any contact with the outside world. We know they, they exist because flights over the jungle have been done to identify their territory. So this is still a place that has people who live the way they always have. And they're very vulnerable because at the time of rubber tappers and gold miners, um, you would go in and with a simple cold or a flu, half of the people in the tribe would actually die. 
because they didn't have the immune system. What I found out when I went there in 2007 is that these tribes have between 50, 50 and 80, 80% hepatitis rate, A, B, C, and Delta. How did hepatitis get there? So it was a question I wanted to answer, but more importantly, why isn't anyone doing anything about this? Why is the Javari not on anyone's map? Why does the news not talk about this place? How can we accept 50 to 80% hepatitis rate? Two theories for hepatitis. One, it was brought in um, from the Peruvian side where they do have the same tribes over in Peru that are not protected, and that in an exchange of, of different tribes, it got spread that way. And the second is a conspiracy theory, that the government's actually trying to eliminate these people for the use of their land, because agribusiness is huge business. 85,000 square kilometers of protected territory. Where there are indigenous people, there is no deforestation across the planet. There is no deforestation on indigenous land. And if you look at the Amazon, and Brazil specifically, the trees are standing where there's indigenous territory. It's that simple. I had asked, actually, an indigenous leader, and this was, a, I love these moments in life where you just get this big lesson from something simple. I asked an indigenous leader, this is in my 2007 interview, so how do you live sustainably in nature? <laughs> And I'm thinking I'm doing something good by giving and getting information. And he looks at me and goes, I don't understand. And I said, okay, well, sustainably means living in balance with your environment. And he goes, yeah, no. And then he looks at me and he spends, you know, 30 seconds thinking. And he says, oh, okay. And I can see in his mind he's going, oh, my God, white girl. <laughs> Foreigner. We're all called white, by the way, if we're not indigenous. Um, he says, okay, well, when I cut a tree down, I plant one so my grandchild can have a good canoe. Uh-huh. He's like, and when I go hunting, I only kill what I need for my family. And I just had this moment in my life where I went, wow, full circle. They've always lived sustainably. There is no choice but to live that way because they live in complete harmony with their environment. Because if they cut too many trees, they don't have what they need. If they kill too many animals, they don't have what they need. Simplicity. We have come so far away to come back full circle and we've created so many theories and so many words for sustainable development. But it's actually a beautiful thing. It means we're coming back to a basic understanding of how we've always lived, right? So for me, those life lessons, when somebody looks at me and goes, yeah, you're kind of crazy, I like it. This is the Javari, um, tri-border area between Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. What you're gonna see now, and um, you'll, you'll have a moment from resting from my voice, um, what you'll see now are excerpts of the film I've been working on for the past eight years. I wanted to do it independently because they said, um, tell our story, not sell our story. So I wanted to do it with the integrity with which I felt they deserved. Um, these are short extracts from the film. They, um, this one addresses the, the health issue, and then I'll show one more. Um, some of it's in Portuguese, but there's English titles. Il y a un problème avec le son. I can hear a hint of it. It's so much better, the sound. It's completely out. There's no way. So this is not my forte, the tech stuff. You can breathe while you're sitting there. <laughs> it's always a good thing. No, it's not. Breathing's not good? Well, you're not supposed to breathe deeply and quickly underwater. <laughs> we'll come do yoga with me. We'll, we'll do a little breathing exercise before we get in the water. So while we're fixing, while we're fixing this issue, because that is actually a, a, a great segue to um, diving and getting underwater with these animals, I mean, I, does anybody dive? Yes, a few. Yes. Snorkel? Swim in the ocean? 
pretend you're swimming in the ocean in your bathtub. <laughs> Actually, I saw a photo of like, there was a photo of a, of a guy in a bathtub with a, red, with a red hat. And he was saying, I am Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> um, the, some people have asked me like, what is your most amazing moment? And, and for me, it is essentially when I feel small. What's your most amazing dive? Oh God, I don't know, I've had so many, but I'll tell this story. What's your most, which place do you want to go visit again in the world and why? Oh, it's this one. It's because I feel small. So uh, a whale, um, I'll just go back for a second because I hate interrupting, but um, humpback whale and, and her mother, we were filming in Hawaii and there was a moment, so we had permits huh, for those who are scientists. <laughs> we had strict permits. But we were diving with a humpback whale and her baby, and um, she allowed us to be next to her. And I say that very thoughtfully. She allowed us to be there. And there was a moment where she, they came really close to us, and then her eye sort of moved, and she looked at me. I might have hyperventilated. Because you feel like you exist. Everything has meaning. It just all comes into focus all of a sudden. And you feel so small in that massive ocean and just this whale that acknowledges your existence. I had the same feeling just about a month ago. We were hiking on a glacier in Patagonia. We were hiking on a glacier in Patagonia. We were doing a film, a documentary film. I wasn't just hiking on a glacier. It's called the Pio Once in, uh, in Patagonia. It's actually one of the few glaciers that's still growing. Hope. It rains a lot there, so the glacier is still advancing and growing. And we were in the middle of this glacier, and I looked around on one side, and it was glacier as far as the eye could see. And on the other side, glacier as far as the eye could see. And I felt tiny. And it's so good to feel so small because you feel significant in such a much more and deeper and, and conscious, important way than just feeling big and important in the world, right? So I wish upon all of you, and take this really well, that you feel so small one day. Armando is the second son of the chief, and in the chief's absence, he represents his village. Eu sou agente de saúde daqui da Rio do Rio Novo, da aldeia. E as doenças, muitas assim que acontecem nessa comunidade, assim, a todas as comunidades vale de Javali que acontece, é, muitos parentes morrem com hepatite. Morreram quatro pessoas no mesmo tempo. Um dia, outro dia, outro dia é, aconteceu. Depois que fizeram o exame, descobriram que é a hepatite. Né? É, muitas, assim, malária. Muita malária. Quatro meses. Quatro anos de malária. Quatro anos de malária. Ele não está recuperando. Está recuperando, ele só está cansado, está fraco. Ele já está na cintura, ele está deixando cantar. E o malária aqui, deixando o que me está sentado aqui. Está ficando aí. Ela já teve muitas malárias. E não se fala. E não sabe quantas. Muitas malárias. Só o dia no mar, o pico está deixando. Quando ela tinha 12 anos, que ela teve malária, quase que ela não ficava. The sound is a little off on that one, but I think you understand it. Um, I want you to go back to the one thing that's the most important in your life. Do you have it? The second part to this, what would you do to protect that? What would you do to keep that safe from anything? And just imagine what you're capable of to protect that thing that's the most important to you in your life. And hang on to that second part, okay? This is, um, you'll see two people here that are uh, non-indigenous. One is Beto Borges. Uh, he's a Brazilian and works for Forest Trends, a nonprofit organization that does tremendous work with indigenous tribes. And the second one is a man named Sidney Pozuelo. Uh, he's an indigenista, somebody who defends indigenous peoples in Brazil. Um, he is, he's kind of a, a an older Indiana Jones, hardcore, fight the system kind of guy. If he were 40 and I were single. <laughs> you'll see, you'll see, there'll be ladies in here too, I'm sure. 
Um, but Sidney's one of those people who's a hero, and, and not a hero in the massively public sense, although he has been recognized, but he's one of those heroes for all the right reasons, um, and it has nothing to do with, with uh, recognition or ego. Um, so I'll let you see the second part. Greed is what has driven the invasion of other people's lands over the course of human history to take what is not of our own, killing in the name of profit. And that's still what's happening today. The current paradigm of agribusiness development is really leading the deforestation that is taking place in the Amazon. In the past 30 years, we've lost 17% of the Brazilian Amazon, mostly driven by cattle ranching, soy production, palm oil, and lobbying. Just take soy, for instance. This year, Brazil hit one of its records in soy production, 114 million tons of soy. That has taken 65 million hectares of land. China is buying at least 50%, but also there's a lot of soy being exported to Europe. And the beef that is produced in Brazil is still a large commodity coming to the United States, to selected countries in Europe, to Asia. We take their land, their oil, gold, fish, timber, and minerals. And with that depletion, we impact our own need for fresh air and water that the Amazon provides the rest of the world. When you think of an indigenous territory the size of Portugal, which is the case of Deja Vai, many in favor of development of any cost in Brazil, they will say, well, that's too much land for just a few Indians. We can't change history. We can't change the past. But we can make a better future by knowing our own past, what we've done, what we could have done differently, how we feel about it, and how we act on it today based on what the past teaches us. Até essas terras de indígena se destinam o povo que vive ali possa continuar na sua vida tradicional porque eles nunca destruíram o meio ambiente. Os homens hoje raciocinam com o bolso. É com o dinheiro que eles raciocinam. Não, 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 não há mais sentimento de amor à terra, de preservação, do cuidado que nós temos que ter com o outro exterminar o meio ambiente. É lamentável que a gente veio viver e estamos vivendo uma época dessa, né? É muito, é muito ruim. Mas enfim, temos que combater isso e não desanimar. So I think that last part's the really important part is to not lose heart. Um, there are 5,000 warriors in the Javari defending their land. And I wake up every day thinking about them. But I also wake up every day knowing that if they have the energy to keep fighting, so should we. And if you go back, the most important thing and what you would do, just keep doing that. But keep extending it further past that one thing that's most important to you. Because you have the energy, you have the power to do that. We all do. We were talking earlier, or yesterday, I think it was about this notion of, of waking up with purpose. Why is it that I'm not pessimistic? Well, because I have purpose. There's a reason I do this. I'm exhausted some days, and there are days I don't want to care because it's easier to not care. It's easier to not know, it's easier to not care. It's easier to stay on my iPhone doing my WhatsApp and my Instagram. So much easier. But I wouldn't be satisfied because I know. And it's actually really satisfying to be able to move forward knowing that you can make a difference. These are the people I work for. These are my bosses. And I know that every single day, that if I stop working, can I face that? Can I face them and tell them, eh, I'm too tired today. Can't deal with their, your hepatitis and your malaria, your governmental issues, gold mining, blah. So I stand up every day and I do it again. And yeah, I need a nap a lot of the time. I've discovered the miracle of the 15 minute nap. This is my son years ago, but it's one of the cutest pictures of him. I just want to eat him. Um, and he's my boss, not because I let him boss me around, except on Fridays, but because I have to tell him that I did everything I could. That's why he's my boss, because every day, that's what I defend. 
Can we do the same thing for her? Can we see them the same way? I think that's what we need to do. We need to change our lens. We need to wake up with that consciousness and understanding that there's somebody who cares just as much about this little curl that I care about my son, but they don't have the means to do something about it. But I do. And I think we all do here. And that's the hope. That's what's important. These people, they're out there every day fighting. These are amazing individuals who are doing such good things in the world. And they don't get invited to the Chateau de Chambord to talk about the relationship with nature. They do it anyway because they know, because they wake up every day with purpose and know why they're doing it. And so I want to give them a platform. That's part of my job, is to celebrate these people, who they are and what they do. Because they also help me. They're my warriors. I know when I wake up in the morning alone, sitting at my computer, writing 200 emails, they're out there doing the work and they're standing with me. So you need to find your family, find your community and find your warriors just to remember that you also need your 15 minute nap and you also need strength. I took this picture in uh, Patagonia a little while ago and um, God, if I had my, my way, I would be doing macro a lot. You'd find me just really close to everything. <laughs> um, do you feel like doing part three? Maybe you might feel a little uncomfortable. Are you okay with that? Okay. Except if you're holding a sleeping child. <laughs> Can everyone just stand up for a second for me? Anyone might have to go over this way. So um, last week in Brazil, I went to a conference called Global Nexus. And um, they do these touchy-feely things. And I felt really awkward. I was like, oh, God, here we go. But I make people breathe all the time anyway. So this is related to this photograph. It's related to why I'm showing you this. It's not just about raindrops. It's about what's between those raindrops. And that's you guys, right? So with your right hand, touch someone who's wearing a dark color. Right hand, someone with a dark color. It will get uncomfortable. You're going to have to move. With your left hand, you're going to have to put your phone down. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. <laughs> you will. In with your right hand, touch someone with a light color. You got to keep your left hand and your right hand. You don't get to let go. This is going to get uncomfortable. You're going to have to move closer. There we go. Perfect. Everyone touching? Do you have any more limbs? Which one? Oh, a left foot. So with your left foot, touch someone with straight hair-ish. Straight hair. You don't, you don't have to touch the dark or the light. You just have to touch the person. You can't touch the same person twice. Don't, no cheating. What do you love? What matters? You guys are hot. This is awesome. Does anyone have a, uh, another foot? Touch someone you don't know. Other foot N need to be somebody you don't know. Getting hot? Okay, I'll just, I'll be the person you don't know by touching through osmosis. You've got a head. Find somebody to lean on. Anyone? Do it. Touchy-feely, man, do it. This is not my French side, this is my American Brazilian side. Can you all remember this moment right now? Can you remember this? These are the people you count on. This is your network. These are your warriors. This is your family. You're here for a reason. Don't forget that, please. You can go back. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, yoga, breathing. Now it's warm, you can take your jackets off. One last slide and we're done. If you take a really close look, this, this for me is us, right? We are nature, nature is us. Species are in nature. We are in nature, species are with us. We are just one species on this planet. That's all we are. We're small. But we can do so much. We are so powerful. We can live with hope, we can live with purpose, we can move mountains, we can create goodness. We are intelligent, we're smart, we're knowledgeable, we're educated, we're powerful. That's what you need to walk away with. All of that stuff you see that is hard to hear, take that and let it feed you. Let that feed you in wanting to do more. They're, they're out there fighting every single day and we need to as well. Because in the end we are nature. We are what's standing in that water, and that's us. So I want to thank all of you for indulging me in the breathing, indulging me in the cuddling. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it off now. So thank you. <laughs>